And do you have ever, ever have a day when you feel like you have nothing left to give? I mean, there's no gas in your tank, no food in the fridge, no money in your bank account, and no time in the day. A lot of you are nodding. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I feel this way, life doesn't stop. The emails keep popping up in the inbox, and the phone keeps ringing, and the electric bill still has to be paid, and I still have to write a sermon. My to-do list feels like 5,000 hungry people, and I have nothing to give them. Do you ever have an attitude of scarcity? You and I are constantly bombarded with the idea that there's not enough to go around. We're told that our planet is running out of oil and that there's not enough water for our region. We're told there's not enough credit for our economy, not enough jobs for our workforce, and not enough buyers for our homes. Our world seems to be running out of just about everything we need, not to mention everything we want. You know, the world may try to tell us there's not enough. But have you ever noticed that the Bible has a special fondness for stories in which anxious scarcity is dispelled by miraculous abundance? From the opening pages of the Bible, we learn that God created the universe from nothing. God didn't require anything outside of God's self to create this entire cosmos. And that was just the beginning. Remember the Exodus? Every single day for 40 years, God provided water and manna for the wandering Israelites. And the supply never, ever, ever dwindled or disappeared. They always had enough. Even when the people got sick of manna and said they wanted the meat, we're told that a wind from the Lord brought quail from the sea and let them fall beside the camp about three feet on the ground. Our God is a God of abundance. Well, and a God with a sense of humor, you want meat? Okay, I'll give you three feet of dead birds. Then we get to the New Testament and all those stories about Jesus, like when the wine ran out at the wedding. What does Jesus do? He turns water into wine and not just some. He makes 180 gallons of the best testing wine they'd ever had. Abundance. Or the well in Samaritan when Jesus tells a woman about living water springing up to eternal life. Not just a trickle, but water all over the place. Abundance. In Jesus' farewell discourse with his disciples, he says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places, not just room for a few, but an expansive and inclusive kingdom, abundance. Or think about the stories Jesus told, like the father of the prodigal son. He didn't just welcome his son back, he did it with a huge, extravagant party. And it wasn't that the Good Samaritan just stopped to help. It was the way he stopped. He put the man in his car, took him to the hospital, told the doctors, here's everything, all my credit cards, my checkbook, everything. I'll be back in a week, and if there's not enough money, I'll give you more. I don't think he even knew the wounded man. Isn't that just a little bit overly generous on the part of the Samaritan? And what about our story today, the feeding of the 5,000? This is the only miracle that's reported in all four of the Gospels, and they even agree on the basic facts. They all agreed that the food on hand consisted of five loaves and two fish. At all report, there were approximately 5,000 men present, which means there were probably another 10,000 women and children. And in all four gospel, the obvious question is something like, where are we to find, how are we going to pay for, what are we going to do to feed so many people? An attitude of scarcity. The people have been listening to Jesus all day, and the sun is going down, and everybody's tired and hungry and the disciples just want the people to go away. But Jesus isn't going to miss a teachable moment. So Jesus says to the disciples, you feed them. Excuse me? With what? Walter Brueggemann, who's a well-known biblical scholar, says that the disciples in this story are living at a liturgy of scarcity. They looked at the crowd and looked at the resources and said, we don't have enough. Bring me what you have, he said. So they gave him five little loaves of bread and two dried up fish. And Jesus took them, blessed them, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples to feed the crowd. Took, blessed, broke, and gave. Sound familiar? But the story doesn't stop there. The disciples took up what was left over and there were 12 basketfuls. That's not only fulfillment, but a surplus, an abundance. 
That's the way it is with Jesus. Whether it's wine at a wedding or rooms for eternity or pick with their food, there is always more. Now, sometimes we think that this radical kind of abundance is only limited to biblical times, but we're wrong. The feasting goes on. The bread and the fish and the quail and the bread and the wine, they never stop flowing because our God is a God of abundance. And in 2019, God is still providing more than enough. About 20 years ago, God gave a dream of starting a church for folks who might not walk through the doors of a traditional church. A church where all were welcome where you didn't have to have the answers and you didn't have to wear fancy clothes and where all ages could participate. I spent about six months praying about it and working with a spiritual director and a therapist and a professor of spirituality at Columbia Theological Seminary in Atlanta. And finally, I shared the dream with executive of our presbytery and she said, great, but you know that nobody will come. There's absolutely no money, but if you think you can grow a church with no money and no people, go for it not too encouraging so I sent out a letter to people I thought did not participate in a faith community and told them why it had been important for me to participate in a faith community and invited them to come talk about the possibility of creating a new congregation 38 people showed up we didn't have anything when I sent the letter to the people we the only people we had were five people in my family then we had another 33 well not quite because not everybody stayed but we had some people We didn't have a building or a copy machine or hymnals or an organ or communion wear or church office. No money. It would have been easy for us to say, how can we feed these people? We don't have anything. But God we worship is not a God of scarcity. Our God is a God of abundance. And our worship grew from 38. And God kept showing us over and over and over that God would provide. We began meeting in a park because we could meet there for free. When we had been meeting a few weeks, a man from my previous congregation called and offered to smoke some briskets and chickens and provide all the trimming so we could have a meal and invite lots of friends. So we had a big barbecue in our park, and some of our charter members came from that one meal. It was free food, so they decided to show up, and somehow (laughs) they met Jesus in that meal. We didn't have any money to advertise, but we did have Bill Murray, who was a great cook. We finally decided we need something a little more permanent than the park. So we rented an old house in downtown Round Rock. But we didn't have any chairs or tables in the park. We had said, bring your own chair. So people had brought their lawn chairs for worship. Well, I remember seeing a bunch of chairs and tables in an old storehouse behind the church building where I was currently serving. They were glad to get rid of them. They were not pretty, but they were free. So soon, we had chairs But soon we ran out of space. But there's a funeral home across the street from this church house. And they let us worship there for free. Well, as long as there wasn't a body there. And that's another story I'll tell another time. (laughs) They had a chapel and they actually let me use their copy machine for free. So we had bulletins. Then we found this location. Five acres in a house for $160,000. Not possible land is not that cheap on Gaddisco Road but the God we worship is a God of what abundance still how could 50 people not 50 families 50 people that included youth who were confirmed so if my family there were five of that 50 how could 50 people raise $58,000 cash in three weeks for the down payment God provided and we moved here When we built our sanctuary, we used every single penny possible for construction. So no new chairs, just the old metal folding ones. And some blue plastic ones another church had given us. Our pulpit furniture was a pulpit from a Nazarene church, which we still have. Baptismal font from Westminster Presbyterian Church. Communion table that Carl Birkeland built. Nothing matched. (laughs) Still doesn't. But God was here. Then one day, Melissa Hutcherson called to say that the Ex-Students Association had some Pale burnt orange chairs they wanted to sell. Five dollars a piece. We didn't have the money, so we said thank you, but no thank you. They said, okay, we'll give them to you, and we'll even deliver them to you. We didn't even have to go pick them up. 225 chairs. When we'd built in this building a few years, the house was bursting at the seams with children and youth classes, so we made plans to build an educational facility. $1.8 million. We didn't have that kind of money. We prayed about it a lot. What were we going to do? Where were we going to have Sunday school? 
One day Kevin was having conversation with a friend whose church had some portable buildings they were going to sell. We went to look at them. They were great. How much, I asked. He said $25,000. Now, I'd been looking at used portable buildings, and they were $40,000 a piece. And so I said $25,000 for each one. He said, no, $25,000 for both. I said, I'll get you a check today. <laughs> we got two portables for $25,000. And then when they couldn't deliver them on time, they gave us another small portable. Three portable buildings. Our classroom and office space more than doubled for $25,000. Our God is a God of what? Abundance. Abundance. Now you may be saying, well, that was in the early years. I mean, have you looked at the budget recently? We don't have any money. There's so many needs, but we don't have money. Tony Campola, who's a professor of sociology and a popular speaker at churches, was once invited to a women's conference where he used to give a major address. These women were being challenged to raise several thousand dollars for a mission project, and while he was sitting on the platform, the chairperson asked him if he would pray for God's blessing as they considered their individual responses to the goal and the ways in which they could get others to give. Campolo stood and graciously said, no. He approached the microphone and said, you have all the resources necessary to complete the Midges Project right here in this room. It'd be inappropriate to ask for God's blessing, which in fact God has already blessed you with abundance and the means to achieve the goals. The necessary gifts are in your hands. As soon as we take the offering and underwrite the mission project, then we'll thank God for freeing us to be the generous, responsible, and accountable stewards that we're called to be as Christian disciples. And they did. They raised every dime and some more. I know times are tough, and I also know that God has blessed everyone here abundantly. We all have something to share. Food, energy, time, money. And when we take it to Christ, he takes it, blesses it, breaks it, and distributes it. And somehow it is miraculously multiplied. Friends, are we going to live out a liturgy of scarcity? Or are we going to start embracing a theology of abundance? What are you going to give? May 2019 be a year in which we celebrate that our God is an abundant God. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have just given us so much abundantly you continue to pour out your love and blessings on us and yet we hold on tight to our meager little gifts god help us to let go help us to know that you will provide all that we truly need may we be your faithful stewards giving of ourselves in every way in jesus name we pray amen